Well, welcome, Justin, and welcome back, John and Neil, to the Build Me Brew podcast. Thanks for coming on, guys. Thank you. Well, good to be here. Now, today's episode, we're, we're going to be talking about the layout and overall design of a brewery. And I feel today's episode is going to be somewhat of a special one, um, as there's been quite a bit of, I guess, planning put into today's episode, just to make sure we're covering all the different um, content today. And, you know, there's a lot of experienced heads coming together here to share, I guess, c- collective years of wisdom um, on, you know, for, for aspiring and in those in, in planning um, to, I guess, take into account for when they're doing their, their brewery build, especially for the layout and design side of things. So I'm um, no doubt a lot of people get a lot from today's episode, but um We'll be covering a lot of ground, Um, I guess, just to give people a little uh, preview of what we'll be covering. um, We're going to start off with, I guess, the foundational questions that need to be answered uh, to assist people in their layout of their brewery. Um, So understanding some of the, I guess, uh, answers to some of those questions will help flow the rest of the brewery build. And uh, some of these questions have been phrased from um, John um, Bespoke Brewing's website article on um, brewery layout. So if people want to um, get some more context around that, I'll um, link that in the uh, show notes. Um, But other things like knowing what sort of business model you want to be, you know, brew pub or production, annual production goals, your sales strategy, uh, I guess the space you're working with and, and, you know, if you have any expansion goals as well. So we'll, aim to cover all that. Um, Then we'll move into a a bit of a a mock type consultation um, where all three of you guys are going to be consulting me as if I'm a client, Um, currently looking at starting a brewery. And we're going to take the audience through somewhat of a, I guess, a firsthand look of what they need to be considering as as well as showcasing some visuals. I know, John, you've got some um, uh, blueprints, some 3D modeling um, visuals that you're going to be sharing with us. So we'll make them available on our website and social channels. Um, so, but before we, I guess, dive into all that, um, uh, John, if you wanted to, uh, you've been on the podcast in series one, if you wanted to maybe do the honors with introducing yourself first, and then we'll move into some, some brief introductions of the, of, of the other guests on today. Sounds great. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, Originally from Austin, Texas, I'm now kind of uh, leading uh, this bespoke team, currently based out of China, South China. Uh, I've been here for 14 years. Over the years, i um, been lucky enough to work in the Australian market, and that's uh, our biggest market right now. So I have a lot of experience with um, setting up, uh, working with clients, uh, and really trying to help clients in that industry uh, work through all the nuances of, of um, getting set up. So hopefully I can add some value in the in the call. And thank you, Chris, for setting this up. Very excited to share. Yeah, no, I, um, I'm i excited to have you back on. Uh, I think the equipment sourcing segment um, back in series one was one of the most listened to and yourself and Neil played a big part in sharing some really good content. So why not having you all back on? But, um, uh, and I don't know if we're going to be providing the exclusive of this sort of announcement it sounds like it's not been a very well-kept secret of um you know justin coming on board for the the bespoke team but uh maybe a good opportunity now justin if you wanted to i guess provide a bit of uh, a background on on your experience today yeah sure thanks and um, thanks for having us on uh chris it's um my background i've been in brewing for about 15 years now um started out with a love of beer from the the mighty sail and anchor in wa and i'm a wa boy at heart um and then ended up getting a getting my first gig in a in a brewery that opened across the road so um the the, the head brewer there who hired us uh he uh he took off pretty quickly for family reasons we filled the tanks and that's about the only uh training i got so i went and enrolled in university uh that afternoon uh, there was a great course over here at edith cowan uh, uni and um, potentially uh, faked it till I made it for a little while there or, or potentially still am. Uh, and uh, yeah, had a great four or five years there at the Monk, a little six hack system. Uh, took the big jump to the dark side and went and worked for Lion Nathan um, at the Swanbury where our tanks were 7,380 hectolitres. So put a fair bit of beer out there. Unfortunately, Lion knocked that place down. So um, I then made the move back to that mid-size range uh, with Colonial Brewing Co down in Margaret River. 
and um, moved over to Melbourne, where I am now, um, to, to kickstart their second brewery, which was in Port Melbourne, the old Matilda Bay. So um, about five years ago, I left all of that to take another dark side move and join sales. I've been with Mintani for the last uh, nearly five years now um, and transitioning now onto the next uh, crazy adventure, which is helping John go on. Um, this is a real passion for me. I've sort of, um, I've done some consultancy over the journey. Um, indeed, I'm sitting at Jetty Road Brewery at the moment down in Dramana, which um, helped uh, consult and reference a few things on here because we're involved sort of on the three stages of growth. Um, but it's, yeah, essentially it's um, super exciting. This is the part of the, the job I love to recently designed a brewery for Hawkesbury Co going in Marrickville. Um, and I'm really passionate about the layouts and the, it's just the part of the brewing I love is getting that sort of detail right. So it's a really good fit for me to come on with John Gon and uh, hopefully help more people, you know, get it right from the ground up. So, yeah. And, uh, and once again, I'm really glad of, you know, perfect timing that we've done this episode. You just joined the bespoke team and going to be able to share even more um, advice and, and value to the audience. But, um, uh, and Neil, uh, very well known in the BMAB community and uh, featured on the podcast before. Um, mate, glad to have you back on. And uh, I guess just for the audience sake and purpose of the um, episode, uh, if you want to do a brief introduction on yourself, mate, uh, take it away. Uh, well, thanks, Chris. Thanks for having us back on. Um, I started brewing straight out of uh, high school. Um, so I started when I was 17. I wasn't actually legally be able to, able to drink when I started or making beer. Started at the bottom, you know, working on the bottom of the line, cleaning tanks, and then just did an old-fashioned apprenticeship. And I find myself, well, 25 years later, still in the industry, still enjoying making beer, and it's taken me around the world. So I've been Portugal, France, Bermuda, and now, um, like John, I'm based in China. Um, I'm now in Shanghai, and um, I help people source equipment from China and help them with their technical stuff and, you know, putting breweries together. So I guess to start off with, and um, we've already, give, already given the audience a bit of a, an idea of what we're going to be covering today. And just to set it up even better, um, John, you, your website uh, at Bespoke did a really cool article on brewery layouts. And uh, I guess I thought it would be good to start this uh, segment off with, I guess what the foundational questions are that a brewery owner needs to be answering before they start going down the path of sourcing equipment and, and setting up the brewery. So what, what are some of these uh, foundational questions that need to be answered? The three big ones, in my opinion, are, you know, what type, actually four, um, you know, obviously what type of model do you want to go for? I think that's for, first and foremost, really going to drive uh, what direction you're heading and how big of a system, which really defines everything. Uh, and on top of that, you know, how much budget do you have? How much beer do you, do you need to make? Um, really kind of yeah, drive all of that logic and, and steering you down that path. And we've become pretty good using tools to try to help people establish and understand um, and plan for uh, those questions, because those are the top three that we, we ask people when we start off. Guys, uh, anything else you'd like to, I guess, share um, in terms of some of the, I guess, metrics or key questions that need to be asked um, uh, before we sort of dive into, I guess, the uh, mock consultation side of things? Yeah, I'd say um, size of location. If you actually have a location, that's, that's a big one. Um, I know one of the um, BMAB group members was asking about should you find a space for your equipment or your equipment for your space so there, that's one of the key ones I think we will definitely end up going into for sure because I think maybe some of us will have slightly different ideas about it but it's some general rules that you tend to follow on that and I think it's very easy for uh, aspiring or those in planning to get really hung up about what type of equipment they're going to get and uh, once again driving home these this is your homework that you need to be doing before i guess you know um before you start getting quotes and all that or um and so forth so uh justin anything else to add in the i guess the foundational side of uh you know designing your brewery no it's just a clear understanding of where you want to end up i think if you there's a very dangerous period in the middle of, of growth where you can be spending a lot of money and not making any so you've, you've kind of got to make the commitment to hit that higher, you know, one and a half million plus or mm -hmm. potentially understand at the start, you're going to stay under that. There's a, probably a dangerous zone in the middle 
where you you need to spend more to get there, but you don't get the rewards at scale yet. Yeah. Um, but that piece, Neil, sit phone to was perfect. You know, I think you've got to find your space first. Um, you can definitely be talking to equipment manufacturers, but you might get a long skinny shed. You, you might need taller tanks and skinnier tanks. You can't you can't finalize any equipment until you know where you're putting it. As many people on this uh, listen to this series know, that's sort of the trap I fell uh, fell into. Um, you know, just sort of seeing what it's going to cost me. So, um, but uh, and some of the 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 typical, I guess, brew houses that uh, John that your your business tends to to deal in. The what what is the sweet spot at the moment in terms of size systems that. Uh, you know, you're, you're sort of putting out in, in um, projects currently. I'll start talk with the brew pub model because I think that's where a lot of people will uh, gravitate towards. Uh, mm. We're seeing a lot of, you know, 10, 12 heck, uh, 1,000, 1,200 liter breweries going out there. And I think that is now being um, very much driven by the fact of these new, uh, I guess, what is it? Excess rebate, it would be the, the correct term that is just put out. So that, that sizing, um, depending on Justin hitting on the head, also just trying to figure out where you want to go. And I think with that sizing in the maybe 10 to 15 heck, maybe even go up to 18 heck, that range there is what I'm seeing a lot of people gravitate towards. And in you know, the U.S., I'm seeing more probably the seven barrel to you know, 12 barrel. So in that range again, um, but it, it really depends what you're trying to do. Talking, uh, I guess, a bit about... Um you know, the monthly and annual production goals and relating that to the recent um, excise rebates that kicked in in the 1st of July this year. Uh, Justin, when we were talking offline, you mentioned, uh, I guess, a, a little interesting fun fact about um, when what that threshold is in terms of annual production and, you know, are you able to share a bit, uh, some thoughts for the audience rela- in relation to that? Yeah, it's a pretty simple calculation on excise. You just want to maximise uh, how much beer you can make without all in that sort of tax-free zone that exists now. Mm-hmm. You know, liken it to earning your tax-free threshold in income and making sure you at least put, put that away each year when you're studying or, or you're young. You know, it's, it's, e- it's easier money. Um, that sits anywhere between sort of 300,000 to, to sort of 400,000 litres, depending on the alcohol strengths you're making. Um, so getting to that volume is, is you know, probably a, a very much, from my point of view, the minimum uh, target you'd have for your annual production after stage, you know, one, two and three's growth um, to sit in that zone. Um, just a, another point around the planning of that tank size that John spoke to, if you know, there's a lot of questions that come into whether it's 10, 12, 15 heck that we can help you go through as well. It might be that you, you want to stay up in that 18 heck mark because you're only going to have three or four beers. Um, what that would allow you to do is have less labour because you're making more beer at a time. Um, but if you've only got three or four beers, your turnover is still going to be pretty decent through those through those um, brands or SKUs. Whereas if you're trying to be the brew pub with 18 beers on, on if you go to an 18 heck, you know, you're starting to produce in the double tank, you're starting to produce a lot of beer that might move really slowly and then your beer quality is going to suffer um, quite severely. So you, that, in that example, you might need two brewers and be brewing more often and be down around the 10 heck mark, still pushing to make 300,000 litres overall, but it just change, changes the configuration based on how many beers you want. So again, those tools John spoke to, we're really working on being able to get that information about where you want to end up and then back engineering that to the optimal sort of, set up for you yeah no some good points um and uh so i guess just to reiterate some of those foundational questions um so i guess it's knowing what type of brewer you want to be so whether it's a brew pub you know with a focus on tap room sales um you know some of these brew pubs will do you know maybe look at expanding into some local distribution like when i mean local very very local um and then Knowing, I guess, the size of your location, which will help people like Bespoke and consultants know what sort of space you're working with and whether certain systems will be able to fit in that space or, you know, recommend, you know, like you're saying, Justin, tall tall tanks or wider ones. Can they get through the door, you know? Um, and then knowing what your monthly and annual production goals and, you know, taking into account what 
excise rebate incentives that you've got, um, linking that to that, um, trying to stay under that threshold. Uh, and I guess, you know, we, we haven't quite touched on it yet, but knowing what your budget is, um, off the top of your heads uh, for the Australian market, do we know roughly for a 12 hex system, I mean, it's going to vary, but what would be a, an expected budget for a 12 hex system brew pub model? John and I were kind of doing some prep work and we were running the numbers and I think it came in just under 200,000 um, Australian dollars, which is about 140,000 US. I think that was right, wasn't it, John? Um, and that correct, was correct. with pretty much all the equipment and auxiliary equipment, including a, um, a keg washer as well. Mm. And just for the audience sake, we're, we're basically saying budget for equipment, not overall brewery build. Yes. Yeah. Yep, that's just the equipment correct. side. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah. And once, once we know, I guess, some of those foundational questions, the answers to that, um, it will help us, I guess, determine the, the brewing system size and, and, and factors that need to be taken into account. Well, I, I guess guys, now that we have a, a good foundation of understanding some of those, I guess, key questions that need to be understood, um, what are, what, what are some of the other factors that need to be taken into account once we understand that information? So how many people you're going to do, or how many people you're going to have, um, how many uh, brews you're going to do a week. And this kind of typical setup, it can be like a, it's more like a one man operation with a one person operation, should I say, and um, with somebody helping out. Generally, when you are starting out, you don't want to be doing more than three times a week because brewing isn't all you're going to be doing. There's plenty of other jobs that you, you, you need to do, um, cellaring, um, you know, doing your gravity checks, cleaning tanks, even cleaning your lines if you're in a, in a, in a brew pub situation. So, yeah, don't think you're just going to get in to do brewing. Um, you know, there's plenty of cleaning. It's probably about 85, 90% cleaning, to be honest. The same thing. It's really get um, into it yourself and become the business, I guess, at the start and call on other people to help you with those auxiliary um, tasks sort of that, you know, you can build up. You basically get an apprentice, similarly to what Neil said he did. You, you get someone who can help out on the packaging line. They, they show an interest. You get them to help you do gravities. You get them to help you clean a tank and sort of complete some of that. Sorry, I'm in a working brewery. There goes the compressor. That's um, all right. <laughs> so, um, yeah, essentially, and you can build it out from there as you train someone up. But don't ex um, you can you can build a team out. But that three three brews a week is is ideal. And in terms of the growth around that, I think you don't want to be brewing more than four days a week. So if your system's getting up to eight brews a week um, of double brews, that's probably about where you want to max out. You've got to be prepared to have an off day public holidays, you know, a backup day if something goes wrong, ingredients don't arrive. Um, so around that, starting around three brews, ending up around eight, probably fits, helps you navigate the size of the system. That's actually a good point. Yeah, we usually account for 50 brew weeks a year rather than 52. I mean, it's only a little thing, but it's definitely something you should work into your, to your calculations. And there, as Justin said, there's always going to be maintenance. Um, when, I, when I work in a brewery, I will say preventative maintenance. Like, for example, before you start the height of summer, um, just go in and make sure your chillers are working, get them serviced and stuff like that to, to, you know, to make sure you can run smoothly in the, the busy season. Did we want to touch on a little bit about, uh, I guess, floor space and some, you know, expansion sort of considerations um, as well? It's not perfect, but start with, uh, for every hectolitre, 100 litres, um, 10 square metres for your brewery space. That will give you a kind of... Um, kind of a good idea of you know the size you you need just for the for the for the brewery brewing area that that calculation does work but it is important to note it's for brewing area not necessarily storage of finished product um or bringing in of raw materials so uh, often people will, you'll find as they grow they end up grabbing a warehouse next door or something to actually push all of that in so their brew house can continue to grow it is um there are other ways to get around some of that stuff. Um, malt on top of a cool room is a really good one. So a cool room um, with some really good structural integrity um, and then all your dry materials can sit up there and then you've got all your elevated dry materials for a nice easy tip into the mill as well. Um, so around that um, 150 to 200 square metres is where most people tend to look at the start. Um, and in terms of the growth stages you asked about, Chris, I think it's important to, to have two things you consider there. It's very easy to add tanks down the track. 
um, to build that growth. Um, what's very difficult to do is to upgrade your trade waste or, um, you know, redo flooring and that kind of thing. So there's a, there's a number of things you want to invest in early, understanding that final number. Um, boilers you want to get, if you're using steam, you want to get that sized correctly that you're not upgrading a boiler in three years and those kind of things. But then there's other components that can be staged along with your growth. Chilling and, and glycol is one of them. If you get a really decent reservoir and some chilling capacity, you can then add chilling capacity to the existing system as, as you call on more demand. Rather, you can't really add capacity to a boiler as you need to do more and more brews. So from a brew house side, that might be bigger hot liquor tanks and bigger cold liquor tanks. So you can have the storage capacity ready to double brew or potentially even triple brew if you need to. Because again, they're going to be things you don't want to rip out and try and sell secondhand two years down the track. And I think John may be able to comment on this. The, the capital, sometimes if a tank's just going up by a metre and becoming a little bit bigger, um, the cost of that is far less than the capacity upgrade you're getting. I think that gives a lot of people uh, some homework to go off with um, before, I guess, they get really serious with their, their, I guess, brewery layout and design. So some really good foundational questions and, and uh, I guess, things that need to be answered. So I guess... Um, Moving on to our next segment of today's chat is, you know, I, I was really interested to do somewhat of a, like a mock client consultation. Um, so I, I really don't know how this might go. It's, uh, we're just really going to be winging it. We've tried to do a little bit of prep and planning on, um, you know, I guess developing what the case study is for this consultation. So uh, John, you mentioned that 12 heck seems to be one of the popular sizes that um for brew houses that people are going with for their their breweries uh so that's what we're going to go with the 12 hex system uh was it two vessel yes sir two, two vessel, vessel mash lauder mm -hmm. kettle whirlpool yep um and the location that we're look you know so the least size location size that we're planning to go with is approximately anywhere between 150 to 200 square meters um the model is uh, a brew pub um our production goals, we're going to try to sit anywhere between that three to 400,000 annual production goal. Um, and the, I guess the expansion goals, I mean, there's going to be a, a, a focus on taproom sales for the first two years uh, with some aspirations of doing some local wholesale distribution beyond this. So, um, so John, I know that you were going to... Um, share screen and we're going to make this available to people to look um, on some of our socials and, 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 and website, but uh, are you able to take the audience through, um, I guess, a bit of a consultation based around that sort of case study? This is kind of what I like to do with clients when we first kind of show them of our, of our capabilities and just take them through the logic and take them through the, the, the layouts, uh, an example uh, per se, and I actually set this up and for these cases where I can just come in and show a client, this is what you got to look at. Because once we're all looking at this, we're just kind of going to go off on it. And I say that in a great way, because we're going to start thinking about things that need to be positioned or placed or thought about or planned for. As you can see, it's, it's 10 meters by 12 meters. And what we try to set up here is, is kind of a brew pub really pushing good volume here. Um, but also it, it can be a, a um, somewhat of a semi, you know, small distribution, I think you can push out of this, uh, out of this capacity, out of this size. Um, and one of the things we like to do here, and uh, exciting thing about Justin joining the team is we're going to go in here and, and kind of change this tank utilization calculator um, to put a little bit more beef, a little bit more meat into it. Um, but as you can see, guys, if you can see what I'm seeing is at a 12 heck brew length, if we're doing, you know, 350,000, setting up these different types of beer, uh, lager, pale, IPA, wheat, stout. Uh, I chose 21 days for the lager turnaround and, and 18 days for the ales. You know, you're going to see at a 12 heck brew length, you're going to need to brew roughly 300 times a year. And you're going to need 14.6, let's just round it up to 15 single brew length tanks to be able to hit those volumes. So that's a good base of at a very high level understanding and driving to say, okay, 
I need this much, whether 350, 350,000 is year one, year two, year three, you kind of know what you need to do to get there. And for rural Australia, possibly, maybe your logger is not 10%, maybe it's 40%, maybe it's 50% because you're brewing to that market. Um, so we like to start off with this as just a visual of, you know, if I went up, if I went down to that thousand through length, you know, how it changes. If I go up to 2000 and I know I only have, like Justin says, I only have three main brands, you know, your, your calculations and the way that you want to approach your equipment and then therefore the layout are going to change. Okay. Sorry. Thanks. That's some of the extra capability we'll, we'll build into that to actually show you how long each beer will actually sit around for based on those calculations. What your average age of, of what the customer is going to drink. Um, you know, if we, we're going to start to build alcohols in there as well and understand what the excise is likely to sit at. So it's really, it's a, it's a balancing act as, as all of these business decisions are in life. Um, and it's just finding those little sweet spots that all come together, but that marry up with what you want to do. We don't want to come up with a cookie cutter solution that solves everyone's problems because no two breweries really want to be the same out there. You know, everyone's you know, got their own thoughts and ambitions. So it's about taking those and fine tuning them and tweaking them to try and maximize, you know, um, getting it right in the first place for those customers. Yeah. It's a kind of add in on that. So um, when you're talking about like cycle times, just, to explain it a little bit more so we talk about tank residency times um and obviously mm -hmm. lagers lagers need a little bit more time to store so if your volumes of lagers go up then you generally need more tanks because maybe you can only brew them into them 12 times a year and then or you know 12 to 15 times a year and then with ales you can do 20 so yeah um depending on what style of beers um you're gonna you're gonna be brewing or you think you're gonna brew when you're you know, researching this, that's why one of the key questions we also ask is um, what styles of beer are you going to be brewing? Because that will heavily influence the number of tanks you'll need. Um, and then we will probably talk about it later, but on some of your biggest sellers, you might want to double tank up or triple tank up as well, um, just to, because it will take up more space and it will be, you know, cheaper investment at the start. Well, that's a good little, I guess, starting point for, for people. And I've, I've seen that tank utilization calculator, John, um, mentioned across some of your social media channels. Uh, is this something that, uh, you know, is available to people um, to use uh, yes. at all? Yep. It, it is on the website. You have to sign up to get to it. <laughs> um, but we are uh, more than happy to, Chris, share this with you or, or do a direct link to it. Uh, yep. One of the things we want to add, and this is a good takeaway that Justin um, really touched on is, you know, a lot of these beers, and I'm going to be drawing on this and guys, please let's use this as a little bit of a whiteboard, you know, the beers and the percentages um, and the cycle times, depending on your ABVs, you know, you can really lock in how much malt you're going to use and some of your raw material numbers as well, which again, are going to gauge and drive the amount of space you're going to need in the brewery to accomplish that brisk cases do you need it how many pallet positions do you need um the more beers you have the more skews of raw materials you're going to need i assume and depending on where you are neil and i were talking with a client in, in in greece you know he's on an island you know so maybe thinking about that and your timing um for that you know you're going to want to do maybe 20 pallet orders you know because of the fact that, that you're paying a lot to get it to you so that that is going to drive and that's something we want to add to this calculator to really beef it up to add more value to it as well and in my layout here i, I just want to explain what i drew um neil touched on double capacity uh guys i, I would say that a lot of times when we talk to a client um, i'm really saying you know you might want to do i'm hearing a lot about i want to do four to five core range i want to do two seasonal um, but a lot of times that four to five core range you're going to have two that just fly out the door uh, you're going to have two beers or two brands or maybe one brand that you know for, and it's going to eat up maybe 30% of your volume. And that's why you consider those double tanks. And that's why we put it in this example. In this example, we have nine single brew length tanks. So if I go back to the calculator, just to kind of teach people and, and guide them, if I want to get to nine on this tank usage, you know, I've got to drive that down a bit. So we're, we're now at maybe a little bit maybe 225,000 at this current configuration. We're at 9.4 there, so maybe 215,000. But then again, that depends on what you're brewing as well. And there's on the other on the other side of that, there's also a centrifuge. You, 
you know, you drop a centrifuge in and your tank residency times change dramatically. Um, but no one's going to drop a centrifuge in until you, you know, that's a difficult one to factor in at this under 300,000 litre stage. Um, but if, you, if you're aiming at the other end of the schedule, you've got to factor in when you can afford that and when it comes online, because it's essentially an upgrade. You know, it's a stage. You can go, okay, we've got this many tanks, we'll put in another row of tanks. And then instead of the third row of tanks, we put in the centrifuge. That's the next big kick in volume. And then maybe down the track comes the final row of tanks. And we've seen a lot in, in this layout in particular, you know, we can indicate, you know, this is year one, um, as far as, you know, what you're getting straight off the back and, and then plan those, those stages. Okay, I know, and I'm gonna change my color here, get a little fancy. Um, I know that red here is my year two, and I know that it perfectly takes up a 40 foot container. So taking into account, you know, what, how much space that is gonna take up and put that in your plans ahead of time. So you can visually see, maybe you're not going to be getting it all at once, but you're gonna be there in year one and year two, and then you can stage your growth. I know I'm gonna get three more, four more single brew link tanks, which is gonna add um, 50 heck a year, I'm sorry, 50,000 heck or 50,000 liters a year um, in capacity and you stage that up. Maybe if we, um, uh, for what, what we're looking at here, and I know we've touched on some of the, the you know, the, the tanks and, and the vessel side of things, but, you know, for people looking at this for the first time, these sort of plans, uh, are we able to sort of go through some of the main aspects of what we're looking at here in terms of uh, mm. where your malt storage is, your cool room, the row of tanks, et cetera? On this layout, I'll just point out what we do and what we like to do, which I think is very important. On all of our layouts, we, we put, you know, the most important, in my opinion, critical is, you know, how big the tanks are going to be, how much they weigh. Uh, that's going to really drive your location and whether or not, like someone said, you know, can we get it in the door? Um, so starting off from there, uh, we start, you know, like I said, playing Tetris, you know, really trying to drive and understanding the process flow, which is driven a lot by the access. So um, I, I've, I like to just go through the brew day. Um, so malt, you know, where is that coming in? Where is that being stored? Okay, how are you delivering it to the brew house? So, um, and Justin, you can kind of go off on this. What I thought with this design uh, or this layout, you know, your big roller door is here, essentially. Uh, and then you want to, for efficiency reasons, in my opinion, you want the brewery to flow. And so I was thinking flowing that way. So your, your malt storage is here. You have a grist case, you have your mill delivering it to the brew house. So your malt is, your malt handling is all here, both in and out. Uh, and then it flows down to package to cellar, um, to packaging, uh, and then essentially your your cold room. And I did I did fail to put in a keg washer and possibly keg filler in here. Yeah, yeah, just definitely, definitely work on flow. I mean, brewing is hard enough as it is. Um, so you want to be working uh, smarter, not not harder. Is that the keg washer underneath between the oh, tanks? I'm sorry. That is the keg it's washer. It's pretty cool I use apologize. of space. And I just thought that's a really that's a really good use of space. Otherwise that could be dead space. So you're coming off your mill and there's actually, this is a grain delivery system. So that's going up into Correct. your mash tun. Generally that's going to be Correct. dead space. So that's a very good use of space. And that's what you're saying about it being treacherous. It's definitely treacherous when you get to this point, you're trying to use as much space as, as possible. And yeah, having, this is, you know, this is the flow of the beer. It's, it's going to go through and having your, um, you know, your big tanks at the end, and then you can, you can keg off and you go straight into the, the cold storage is, Definitely, you know, having good workflows will, you know, it's something you definitely have to think about when putting a, a brewery together. And that kind of ties into also where your your floor drains are. I mean, they say um, around about for every liter of beer you brew, you're going to do five liters of water. So you definitely have to have good drainage. It's something you really need to think about. Trench drains, definitely over spot drains or, or anything else, for sure. Mm. It just makes sure you're, 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 you know, you just, when, you're, when you're brewing, you just, uh, how do you say it? how you, you um yeah you just want to do as little you know little manual labor as possible so you don't want to spend half your day pushing water around with the squeegee no that's um talked about quite a lot so basically what we've got here running between the brew house and these rail fermenters is just your your trench drains going right across the brewery floor correct i've been um mentioned yeah just like what you said there neil uh central drain spots try avoid well, otherwise you'll be spending you know, at least an hour of your day, each day you do a brew, pushing water 
to a central drain spot. So, uh, and I, I do aim to also have someone on that just knows flooring and drainage um, to talk a, a bit about some of the important considerations here, but obviously we're just doing surface level sort of info on, on all the different aspects, but uh, no, that, that really helps understand. It makes perfect sense. Um, you know, malt handling area flowing into the brew house and just essentially up to where the cold storage area is and then the cellar in it. Um, and then you could probably look at having your tap room right near all the nice shiny stainless. Yeah, just a couple of things to add to uh, all of those points, Chris. There's uh, definitely the, the flow in and out um, makes sense. I think a couple of other aspects to consider. One is how to bring those other tanks in in stages um, and whether or not they're going to get in. So you need to consider pushing everything, sort of filling out one corner and coming out from there as you, as you upgrade. Um, you need to think about your workspace, not just the flow of the ingredients, but potentially the flow of of you as a person. I think the age old kitchen design is a triangle between the oven, the sink and the fridge, you know. Keg washing cleaning is a really prime example of something that just ticks over. You're not standing there watching the machine. You've got to walk past it, slide the next one on and kick it off again. So you really want to be able to multitask that. You don't want it on the other side of a room if the brewer is going to be the one who tries to clean 40 kegs while they're brewing. Um, so there's little, little triangles to think about around where you're moving or potentially as you get bigger, to keep those people far enough away that they're not on top of each other. Do you want the, the person coming from the bright beer tanks who's trying to pack out beer, running a hose across where the fork has to drive to get to drop the malt in the second brew? So um, a lot of overlap to consider. Um, and just a touch point on the drainage, all of the tanks come on legs, they're adjustable. So, you know, don't be shy at putting a decent slope on your floor. Um, it's much easier to come in on a on a Monday morning and see your floor dry and with no mold on it than a than a wet puddle that you've got to squidgy that's you know starting to turn and and the tanks can level themselves off where we're pretty agile creatures we can walk on a slanted floor um, so I've always been a big believer in putting a decent slope on it and keeping the joint as dry as possible and uh, John just that uh, little sort of legend you've got going on there with the the weights and all that i guess that's very important and it's something that i've never really considered a lot of the the sort of leases and, and spaces that people are working on will be pretty much on concrete slabs you know on the ground floor but you know if you're dealing on a suspended floor you really need to be you know you need to know what your weights are of all your equipment going in i guess yeah thanks chris and that's a great point we've done a, a number of breweries on the second floor or third floors um, of of places and, and that's critical um, you have to let the, you have to give the team, and I say team, local team, the contractors, the, the engineers, uh, you have to give them the information they need to make smart decisions and to plan because you don't want your floor cracking under the weight of, um, of equipment. So we really try to give the dry weight, but not only the dry weight, also consider your wet weight, you know, how much you're putting in there. Um, are you going to be jam packing it full, you know, taking up that 25% headspace? So that, why don't we put that as an inclusion um, into your, um, your calculations? And uh, another point that I, I thought would be interesting to explore and probably very important is, is knowing where your utilities are located in that premises as well. Mm. Because, uh, you know, it's an ideal situation is what we have right here, assuming that the utilities are where we want our brewery to flow, but are you able to talk, I guess, some important considerations regarding utility locations? Great question, Chris. And, and this is, this goes into something that we also do. Once your layout is determined, you know, then you can really see and plan your utilities. Um, so for instance, the reason I put the keg washer here, Neil, nail, uh, what is it? head on the nail or hit the nail on the head. There you go. <laughs> English is going to crap. Uh, but, you know, we, we wanted to use that space above the back of the keg washer to run that auger. But another reason we put the keg washer here, this is a steam heated brewery. Um, running steam lines um, can be expensive uh, and dangerous as well, um, for sure. So from the steam generator, assuming it can be in this location, it's a very, you know, a very short run to all your steam needs. And that includes the HLT, the brew house, assuming you have a jacketed MLT and kettle, obviously jacketed kettle, and then your keg washer. 
um, and Justin in, uh, in the in the resources planning. If a brewer's brewing, you know he can have his pallet of kegs somewhere near the keg washer, and he's just jumping down, putting kegs on, putting them off. You know, so he's trying to multitask because you're not going to be sitting in the keg washer just staring at it. You know, it's it's usually a three to three and a half minute, even more cycle time. So, you know, you put two kegs on or one keg on, you come back five minutes later and you take them off and you run again. So again, just trying to keep that, that workspace. So a lot of considerations to take into account with your utilities and, and talking through glycol as well in this situation, the glycol chiller, let's say it's outside. So all the connect points, I'm just going to come here. Boom. You got to run this way. Uh, and then you got to figure out, okay, now I've got an island of FVs. Okay, well, how am I going to get there? Okay, well, I'm going to come this way, go over and run through the back. Um, because then I know that I can actually, wait, I can actually put another row here. Obviously, the cold storage is getting in the way of that first one. But then planning all that out in, in how you want to build out in your utilities and how they're going to run um, around is, is, is critical um, because sometimes there's a wall or sometimes there's a light or sometimes there's an AC duct and you can't get there depending on where you are. Yeah, no, some really good points there. Anything, any other thoughts, you, uh, Justin, Neil, you'd like to cover there? A lot of the time when a consultant or a, a manufacturer will say, have you got your building? Have you, you got your building? Because, yeah, that's the key. As John said, you, when you're planning a layout, um, yeah, so you don't want your, your you know, your, your steam lines to, to, to go too far. And it's also about your electrical outputs and everything else because, um, you know, three phase, putting three phases in, is, is expensive. So you definitely want to make sure that your, your, your outlets are, where they need to be pre before putting the um, equipment in. Because once you're equipment in, it's harder and more expensive to, to make any changes. One of the questions that actually had come through the through the blog was, you know, you've got an absolutely clean slate. What's the perfect layout? Um, I don't think there is a perfect layout because I, yes, you're right. You could build the building around the perfect layout. Um, and in which case, I think it's it's just a matter of working through this exact same procedure and like making a layout that you think looks aesthetic and is going to work and flow um, and then building the building around it. But essentially, everything always comes back the other way to some degree. And it's important to note you're going to there is going to have to be compromise in there. You are not going to get in an existing building um, everything flowing right to me. Looking at this, the keg washer, you know, is a little bit close up against um, you know, in terms of caustic and, and pushing out what, what it's going to be doing. And if you're using it as a keg washer filler, how are you going to use that um, system to, you know, it's a long run from the bright beer tanks, but there's always going to be compromises and you're always going to get one or two things wrong. What we're trying to do here is minimize um, the inconveniences so that there's small inconveniences, not big ones. To, to add to Neil's point on electrical, you know, this is something as your layout, this is an example brewery that we did um, overseas in India, actually. Um, you know, understanding where all your drop points are going to be and, and making sure that your team knows how much you know, voltage, um, how many kilowatts they're going to need and, and explaining how they're going to hook up because that is all driven by your utility. So when thinking about layout, once that's done with your equipment, you know, we usually do, we try to give five drawings and that's if it's steam heated brewery, steam, electrical, water, glycol. In some instances, semi-automatic, you need compressed air. Um, in some instances, if it's a production brewery, you might want to do CO2 rings, you know, so you want to take and consider all those into your planning, um, because that all just kind of falls in place, if you will, after, um, after the initial layout is done. Just because it's sort of uh, a bit of a hot topic for me at the moment, I, I recently sat down with um, Michael from Aeroflot about wastewater and, and trade waste. Um, any thoughts around where that might fit in the grand puzzle of it all? Uh, is there any sort of mention of, of that here in, in, in this model? In this typical, in this model, no. Um, what we've seen and what solutions, and, and Justin and Neil, please chime in, and I'll just say what we've done before. You know, a client in this corner right here might have a grate, uh, which leads into a sump, um, for instance, or, um, they might have a waste, they might go into a sump and then go into maybe a vessel outside uh, that is for treating. Uh, we did that with a brewery in Melbourne. So they have a sump which has a, a sump pump, a uh, submerged pump, and then pumps it over to a treatment plant, if you will, uh, which can be just a vessel. 
uh, and it sits there and then it's dosed with the acid or caustics to, to get the pH right. And then it sits there for a bit to get the right temperature. And then from there, it is then uh, uh, released into the, the waterworks, the, um, the drains of the building or wherever they are. Um, so that's the, the, the solutions that I've seen or the, um, the, the setups that I've seen mainly. Yeah, I've, I've seen similar setup. Yeah, having the, the wastewater treatment outside. So yeah, your wastewater will go there. That's generally the typical setup that I've seen for something like this, for sure. Yeah, definitely the most common in Australia. Um, and then what happens to the water once you get it out to that settling tank? That's highly council dependent. Um, some people have some great stories um, and some people have some horror stories. Um, some small breweries have to do a lot of treatment. Um, some, you know, big breweries don't seem to be doing much treatment. It's It might just be dependent on um, the luck of the draw some degree. There's no real consistency in it. And that's, I think, an improvement for the industry in Australia to find a real common voice on this is the standard we expect to discharge trade waste. Um, the stuff um, Aeroflow are doing is actually, you know, super advanced. That's um, DAF technology, and and that that produces um, basically it's still it's still waste. It's not um, completely treated, but it's um, very high quality discharge of waste. Um, but it's also pretty pretty pricey stuff that he's putting in. Yeah, I um, I sat down with uh, Michael earlier this week. We did a similar thing, like a screen share, and showed some three D modeling, and there was a. I think a few, uh, I think Atomic Brewing had something like what you were explaining earlier, John, a sump underneath the brewery floor. Um, you know, a lot of them had them outside. Um, you know, some, and, and to go on and what Justin said earlier, it is very council and water, local water authority dependent. Right. Um, you know, some aren't connected to a sewer. Um, if you're in an urban area, uh, you've got the, benefit of dealing with um you know these large plants that can do it for you or if you're rural new south wales you've got to you can't send your waste to the little plant down the road you know it's um you've got to invest in in technology and equipment that can do it all for you so once again another layer of it all <laughs> yeah indeed i mean at, at swan had its own wastewater treatment facility and they even built a golf course next to the brewery to to use all the treated water as irrigation um you take that back to something like colonial which was a, a like john described a, a system for temperature and ph neutralization um and then you, you can even jump that to um something really small like the monk and that was just down down trade waste with a bit of a log around volumes down um so it's all highly highly dependent and there's there's a lot of things you can do before the water goes down the drain um there's probably more being done around hop and trub capture than before um probably a fair bit around yeast capture as well there's been people who have been required to thermalize um their yeast to basically make sure there's no live cells um, heading down in wine regions um, so there, there can be very different requirements around what you are and are allowed to put down the drain and that in turn affects what you're obviously going to buy and, and invest in mm. but it is important i wanted to just uh, reference this is where it's fun with with sharing as we did for a larger brewery recently we, we call this uh, quasimodo <laughs> um, and it just goes to show what people are doing when you know they're um, they don't maybe have the right drainage or they have a, a very um, not very robust council or are very um, flexible in what they put down. So this is actually a mobile and this is just anecdotal, but it's a mobile lauder ton essentially. Uh, so what they would do is they would basically pump their, you know, out of their FEs, pump out of maybe their um, their brights, any residual trub, and they would capture that in here and be able to send that out with their malt instead of taking it down the drain. So we've done, I believe, for a version of this very simple, where it's just a cart that you, you know, you attach your hose or put your hose in that just captures all of that, those solids. So there are um, solutions to those problems. And I'm just showing this as a reference because it was a lot of fun just to design this for that brewer. Excellent. And uh, you've pop something up here on the left hand side as well uh, of the screen um are you able to talk to us a bit about this is related to the pipe work is it yes this is mainly what we've really started to push now especially for the more the bigger breweries this is a brewery that we are planning for the u.s 
Um, and what we're trying to do here is obviously give the brewer an understanding of their space. Um, uh, obviously we put the, the drainage in here, we're showing the pipe work uh, for both steam and, and glycol. And what this really helps doing is, is, as you can see in the 2D world, let's say, and then going into the 3D world, you know, what, what we've become accustomed to is having conversation with the, the local team, the engineers, the designers, the, the contractors, because at the end of the day, we're not just selling equipment, we want to sell a service as well, and a full package um, to say that, you know, we've done this before let's help and let's let's work together so you can get that complete solution. So looking at this, talking with contractors and being able to come on a Zoom and just identify points of, okay, you're gonna need, your glycol needs to be hooked up here. You know, oh, okay, what am I hooking up to? Oh, well, we can supply a BSP thread or we can supply a, a tri-clamp. Uh, okay, where's my steam? Okay, steam and condensate are gonna be coming from here because my, my boiler is in a room right here understanding what capabilities and where things are gonna be flying around to say, oh, I've got AC ducting here, that's a no-go. Okay, we gotta bring this piping in a little bit because you, those things are gonna just fight. Um, we, it just can't happen. Uh, and that can happen a lot in a group hub environment. You know, in a perfect world, you have a huge open box, uh, which we kind of designed here, but there's a lot more going on in the 3D world especially if you're in a, in a brew pub on the second floor and you have a lot of utilities and lightings, you know, the, as Justin said, it's a compromise sometimes between aesthetics and, and what you're actually putting in there because the, the, the architect might want to do lighting and which looks beautiful, but you have a lot more going on there. So maybe we don't take the glycol high, maybe we run it low and maybe we put the glycol points down at the bottom coming in here you know, so you want, it's, it's nice to have that 3D capabilities to be able to see it because it, it really helps connect the dots. No, pun intended there. Or connect the pipes, I should say. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's a, yeah, uh, some amazing points there. And something that you just don't think about is just another sort of thing to consider about your pipe work. And, and, and an interesting point there that you say, rather than being on the top of your tanks, depending on your ceiling heights, you know, look at potentially having them lower. Um, yeah, I guess that's just another mm -hmm. sort of fact that you need to look into. For sure. Yeah, you can just put them out here, which is which is nice right at the bottom of the cone. We've done that for a client and they run everything low yeah, because they don't want to run it high. Or maybe they have glass and they want everything running under the one meter wall that they have. You know, so so we can we can work with that on saying, okay, at one meter I'm gonna have a wall. So I want my pipes to come down here and I'm going to connect everything up, uh, uh, from the ground up, so to speak. Neil, Justin, any uh, comments you want to add or share there? Look, it's, it's around, I guess, if, if we jump back to following that consultation, I think the, that first stuff we've talked about around sizing and manipulation and layout um, is all pretty early. But then jumping into this 3D model, once we think we've got that layout well, this is just that next mm. stage of going, okay, now does it translate that next step? Um, and, and if it does work in here, then we even drill into the next phase, which is actually going into each vessel and looking at that piping. So there's, um, I don't think it, a fermenter is a fermenter, right? But I don't think any of the fermenters we've done of late, John, are, are actually the same. Everyone's got a little bit of a different um, shape that they want. Um, some people want the dry hot ports maybe at the back because they'll be able to lean over from the cool room and get to the dry hot ports. Some want PRVs, you know, right next to them so they can clean them and check them. Um, there's a lot of exactly. customization around that, glycol out the top, out the bottom, and seeing it like this in a, in a 3D um, fashion really helps the brewer go, yep, I want that, I want that. Hey, why is that little dot over there? Um, can I have my temperature probe lowered a little bit so I can reach it from the ground, et cetera. Um, and then jumping that into the um, into the brew house, it's even probably more important to look at the piping on the brew house, um, especially if you've customized things. I mean, bespoke is called bespoke for a reason. It's all around getting it to fit exactly what you want. Um, but then where do those physical pipes, it's a P and ID tells you so much about a brewery and you can make sure you can get the work from where it is to where you want it to go. Um, but now which valve do you have to open? I've worked, um, many kits where it's almost hands and knees to reach in under to open valves under lauder tons on manual systems. Um, so how can we 
engineer that or factor it to just to make it a little bit more user friendly and save you back. So translating this pen ID that John's brought up now to a 3D drawing is is you know a pretty fun stage that we don't get to till towards the end because every time you change something on the PID, it, it reflects in the, there's no point getting it right until you, you're comfortable with everything else. Um, but it's a, yeah, it's a pretty fun stage of the project because it's so visual um, and people can actually see where they're going to end up and and feel like they're in their brewery and, and look at potentially what's going to go wrong or what, they, what they're going to see on when it's there for them to use. And, and these are the progressions, Justin, and great, um, great point. I pull up these drawings. This is the PNID based off of this brewery. Um, so we go from equipment layout to understanding what are the utilities, where things are going, steam, boiler, glycol, chiller, where it needs to hook up to, and then bringing it, you know, this is a 24 heck or 20 barrel, um, but very similar design. So then taking it from here to here to here, and they're all just linked to each other. Um, and it just Given that visibility, it answers a lot of questions and it prevents a lot of issues, in my opinion. So you, I've noticed that you've got color coding going on there for the different types of pipe pipe work being installed. Uh, we've lift, listed some already. Are you able to just rattle off quickly um, all the different ones? You really want to take, in, to me, um, the most important, I'll do it in, in order priority and, and just uh, level of, of difficulty. I think steam is one of the, the hardest ones uh, to, because of the fact that it's regulated. Um, it is dangerous, uh, honestly, so you want to keep that tucked away. So we have our steam lines coming from the boiler out and then your condensate coming back to the boiler because you want to keep that a closed loop. You want to keep that heat in. You want to make it efficient because it's going to save money, good for the earth. Um, and, and that's what we try to preach and understand. Uh, you have your waters, um, so you have your filtered water coming in, you know, that's a consideration as well. What type of treatment are you going to do? What do you need to treat your water? Um, a lot of times in developed countries, you just need to hit it probably with small particle and RO. Um, I'm sorry, RO, active carbon. Um, but, you know, we've done a brewery in, in India, we've done a brewery in Vietnam uh, where they needed an RO filter because the brewer wanted to start off with a good, you know, with nothing and he wanted to build up. His, his water and, and put his chemicals in his salts, his acids, whatever he might need to hit his numbers for the beers that he's doing. So filtered water coming in, you know, hot liquor coming from the pump and going around the brewery, not just to the, to the mixing station on the brew house, but, you know, feeding, you know, I should have put a keg washer here. You want to hook your hot liquor over to the keg washer. So you'd probably extend that and bring it down to your keg washer, uh, your glycol chiller, what it's feeding and how it's getting there. And what are you putting in line to say, okay, I need to have a pressure gauge here. I need, I want to have valves at all my jackets so I can isolate jackets or I can turn jackets on or I can throttle them. Uh, and then something that I'm not showing here is, you know, your CO2, possibly your compressed air, because this brewery here that is a pneumatic or a semi-automatic brew house. So you can see that the valves are actually a pneumatically driven butterfly valves. So that's what this picture is kind of showing. And, you know, as far as your heat exchange, and I'll zoom in a little bit, you know, what's going in and where is it going? You know, as your ward is coming into your heat exchange, you're bringing cold water in, and then you want to send that hot water. You don't want to waste it. You want to send that back to your HLT. So we did that. You can see with the heat exchange here, you can see that pipe coming in, the cold liquor coming in. You got your ward out to your aeration station, but you also want to send that water back over, you can see here, this pipe at the top, going back over to your HLT. So a lot of things you want to take in consideration to just to make um, to make your life easier. To add to that, Chris, so typically the brew kits have been reasonably isolated with, with connections for all of this stuff. What's starting to happen more and more is um, outsourcing that pipe work um, back to the brewery manufacturer. Um, it's a couple of considerations to be really careful of there. Obviously, the more piping and the welding and stuff you can do, the cheaper in the long run. But you've got to maintain that flexibility. So we're starting to tie in hot liquor and cold liquor tanks to sort of all be existing in piping because they're so close to the brew house. Um, glycol, you have to be a little bit more careful because you want to have that little degree of flexibility. You don't want to be completely governed to this plan. If you complete all your piping somewhere else and, that, and the brew kit rocks up and you're like, hang on a sec, I've... I can actually push these tanks back a little bit now that I'm seeing it visually, um, then you're going to have to redo work that you've already done. So it's a combination of 
trying to trying to get as much of that piping structured as possible, but then still calling on local trades to complete the job and and link it all together because you do want that ability just to fine tune things at installation. Yeah, I, I feel like uh, my mind's just been blown once yet again uh, of all the all the different uh, considerations there. And yeah, I, I can't say I ever gave too much thought around piping um, in terms of you know all the different aspects of it and how how it connects and even the aesthetics side of things, especially if you've got your tap room so close and you want them to make that a showpiece to you know people drinking in your tap room it's like well you don't want all this ugly pipe work being shown and all that and um so yeah i guess um another thing for people to think about is there um any other i guess for the purpose of share screening um and for people to get a visual on anything else worth exploring or, or chatting about while i'm screen sharing i know there are some questions on the um on the um, in the Facebook group about possible yes. considerations. And I'll just show some pictures of, of things that we're seeing um, as very helpful. Uh, and Justin and Neil, please touch on this, Neil, especially with uh, with your consulting. And I know this is something that we've talked about before, um, but for say space savings, you know, we're, we're seeing a, a lot, not a lot, but we are seeing breweries trying to use all that vertical. I'm big on using vertical space. Um, because it's there <laughs> and you're going to waste it if you don't use it. So, you know, stacking tanks is one of the things. This is a brewery that we sent to Miami uh, and these are all serving tanks. Um, so they are just pushing, you know, at tap, at brew pub sales. So each one of these, this is essentially is a big keg. Um, and, and what we try to do is, again, try to use that vertical space and it's working well for them. Uh, one of the things that you want to think about also is we, you know, we brought all the pipe work down to, to Florida level so that brewer's not having to get up at, uh, all the time. And uh, assuming they have good SOPs, he won't need to go up and inspect the tank too much um, because he's cleaning it effectively. Um, so you can see them there as well. And, and then, you know, uh, I say when you're designing, when you're designing your tanks as well, you know, don't be afraid. And, and guys, you can touch on the, the 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 foundation of how it might affect the beer. But we're starting to make really skinny, tall tanks um, because space is a premium. So when when you when you essentially make a tank fatter, you're increasing that volume. You can bring the height down. Um, so we play with diameters and heights to really utilize the space there. Um, because you might have 150 square meters for this brew pub, or you might have 50. And how can we work to, um, yeah, to make that easier for, for uh, the clients? And I'll show you another example here as well, where we did um, an FV with a, a serving tank or bright tank on the top. Um, and this is actually a, a wastewater tank that the client wanted us to build for them. Um, so they, they basically have their inlets, their outlets. They actually have a whirlpool function, though if they want to hom homogenize uh, the solution in there, that is a, a, a customized wastewater vessel um, for a brewery um, that we sent to Australia. Just on the uh, topic of uh, taller tanks, uh, taller and skinnier, mm. uh, one thing I've learned in some of my, um, uh, especially my taste studies is... Uh, hydrostatic pressure caused for, for, for the beer as well. Uh, is that something that uh, is, is an overlooked or an issue for people if they go taller? Yes, Chris, definitely. Uh, yeah, the hydrostatic pressure does play a part. A lot of people have a um, preconception that it has a massive effect. I think um, there'll be a lot of breweries out there who have different size tanks for different reasons, who understand they can produce um, consistent results out of those things. Um, more, more so than anything, it's just around that end of fermentation um, and keeping, understanding your top pressures. Um, so it can definitely be managed. There's not a, it's not a restrictive factor. Um, and indeed, if you're starting a brewery and you get your consistency out of it early um, by understanding that you are, all of your tanks are under a little higher um, osmotic pressure and you do have more dissolved CO2 during ferment, then um, you'll just produce the, um, or create the procedures around that to manage it effectively. So um, bright beer tanks though, um, probably a lot less effect. Obviously that's, it changes the effect of top pressure and the calculations you physically have to achieve to get a good carbonation. Um, but if, mo if the majority of your yeast has been removed by that point, 
um, then bright beer tanks can be a really great place to um, save on on a bit of floor space. Uh, possibly is is maybe if your brewery is more focused on lager uh, lager styles, is is tall tanks probably not a good option for that, or is is it once again it can be managed? No, it can be managed. It'd be it'd be more. Uh, it would be harder to manage with the taller tanks. And the other thing with those is you're probably relying on looking for the yeast to set them um, and flocculate out at a little bit of a uh, faster rate. So the taller you go, the longer you're going to actually have to wait for that. Um, mm. The reverse of that is then flipping to horizontal sort of um, that, yeah. beer tanks or serving tanks. Um, they're pretty rare. They're starting to pop up in a few breweries uh, in Australia. In fact, Eagle Bay and Margaret River has had them for a long time. Um, one thing about horizontals is they're super easy to stack. So whilst you might think, hey, I'm brewing lagers, um, I, I don't have much floor space, then you can put a bunch of horizontals, which John's just brought up, um, and put them basically two or three on top of each other. Um, and then you're still getting the same value for a buck or a bang for buck in your, in your floor space. But you're also making sure that you've only got a metre for the yeast to flocculate out in all of those tanks. And therefore, you'll be you, your turnover rates will be much higher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would say yeah. You can start off in the normal fermentation tank and then go over to the horizontals to, to age it. As you again, you said it's it's quicker turnaround times because it's settling out quicker. And but then you're also opening up your fermentation tank to do other beers, so it can actually increase your your throughput. And uh, we're seeing we're kind of seeing lager um, coming back now. So I'm starting to see more people think about using these horizontal tanks as well. Unfortunately, one of the side effects, I guess, with COVID is uh, people had a little bit more time to, to age from beers and lagers seem to be making a, a comeback. So you're having these horizontal tanks. A, it's actually better if you're making lager. You can clear it out a lot quicker. And then also at the same time, it can increase your turnaround town and you can actually free up a fermenter for other beers. I just wanted to point, going through our, our project lifecycle, uh, something to also consider, it has has much to do with the layout is is obviously thinking about your container loading and how the equipment's going to be coming over and getting it into your space and stood up is uh, can be <laughs> quite the adventure i think i put an article out i think last month on it um and yeah just take that in consideration when you are planning things out you know for this in this case understanding especially with freight rates so expensive in this brewery that is prime real estate and wasted space. So filling that up with, you know, 50 kegs, um, 100 kegs, a pallet of kegs, double stacked, you know, taking that in consideration as well. Probably one of the biggest um, things I'm learning from this is trying to capitalize as much as you can on, you know, the height of your brewery, you know, instead of, you know, everyone thinks about what they can fit on the floor you know, where people are maybe introducing, you know, uh, mezzanine flooring or, you know, being able to sack things on top of things and just maximizing things seems to be, I guess, a good way of um, capitalizing on, especially for those with small spaces. I think we've covered quite a lot of ground today. Um, a lot of different little alleyways that we sort of went down that I uh, didn't think we would. So um, I guess if we just to summarize what we've sort of gone over today, uh, driving home some of the main points um, or if there's anything else worth adding um, I'll leave it to you guys to sort of uh, close things out. I think going down that that path of, of the brewery we, we hit raw materials we hit utilities we, we hit kind of flow I think um, storage for cold storage and how you're going to utilize that how that you're going to feed beer to the taps something to think about as well um, the space in that layout that I'll just bring up again, why I left that empty space is uh, for both growth and to consider um, mobile canning or packaging options that might you might grow into or need. Um, you know, right now with COVID lockdowns, mobile canning and getting that packaging to go, growler fills. I think I saw something on um, Excise with growler fills as well, taking that in consideration and planning that into your brewery as well. I know I'm going to need 10 meters or two meters by three meters for my mobile canning. Um, and, and go ahead and talk to your mobile canner. Or, or talk to the canning company that you are going to get in year two or year three to understand the space and what you're going to need to supply to that because plan it in ahead of time. When designing the bar, is it best to have the taps coming off the cool room wall? Look, there's, there's 
pros and cons to all of those situations. Mm -hmm. The direct pour method coming out of the cool room uh, wall is highly effective. Um, there's some great bars and, and brew pubs and, and places around that are using that. Um, the glycol path and python and sort of pouring through at the front of the bar. It's, a, it's around cost, presentation, aesthetics. Um, the cool room solution is probably a cheaper implementation, but it might not suit you to have a cool room directly behind the bar. That might be valuable re real estate and you need to go down the other path. Um, there was a question around efficiency of, of hose lengths and walkways and, and stuff like that. So a couple of other background considerations. Hose lengths, there's, there's no real 100% um, efficiency. I guess you could measure out your longest run for work um, and then you'd be adding a considerable amount to that. You, you're always going to have to snake your hoses to some degree. You're not going to want them um, uh, you know, stretched to their limits. Um, you also have to consider where you're going to hang your hoses to dry out. So you kind of don't want to go too hard with your hoses. You might be better to join two smaller hoses together. Um, so you've got a good, a good hang so they can dry out and, and stay in good condition. Um, in regards to access walkways, you've got to be getting pretty big to warrant, you know, catwalks and, and high access to tanks. A lot of breweries now um, in an OH and S capacity seem to be opting to have a scissor lift or some sort of like a walker stacker. Um, so you're actually locking yourself into that component and taking yourself up there rather than ladders. Um, and they can have pretty good maneuverability. A scissors actually can, can be quite skinny um, and you can squeeze it down the row of those tanks and have some good flexibility with that. Um, whereas, yeah, walkways, you probably want to be at 100 hect plus tanks to, to warrant any kind of a catwalk up there. And um, ladders, obviously, is, is your last solution, I think. I think the, the days of climbing up ladders and dry hopping at anything bigger than 30 hect are, are probably limited. Um, wherever possible in terms of oh and as well yeah and i guess the other thing is yeah the size and where you want to have your if you're going up to that size is where do you want to have your manway top manways or side manways and that can also be personal preference as well depending on on the safety so you can always have a side manway i mean i prefer top manways it's, it's, it's up to personal preference there as well if you have a side one please clean underneath the lip every time please <laughs> Please. take it out yeah take off Please. that seal if you have to take off the seal yeah <laughs> what one thing i wanted to add and and justin we've we're, we're going through this with some clients is is understanding what your pallet sizing is um if if you're going to be passing pallets through the uh, anywhere um maybe sis, we try to stick to 1200 um 12 to 13 maybe even 1500 if you want a little get a little good access for pallet path um, and then on, I'm still sharing my screen, guys, and I do apologize. I always go to this. But, you know, from your heat exchange to your FV is usually what we measure out, your farthest FV. And if it's five meters or if it's 10 meters, then we cut from there. We'll, we'll cut that into different pieces. You can use it for CIP. You can use it for transferring, um, so on and so forth. So I know that's something, Justin, we've been we've been trying to preach on, on those the getting things, raw materials, kegs, pallet of kegs out um, through uh, through the cellar. Yeah, exactly. And I think in, in that space and pallets, it is really important to be able to have some clearance there. You don't want to realise down the track that you can't, you know, drive that pallet of kegs in or the clearance is just so small that you're, mm. you're going to end up damaging equipment. One, but there are some hidden dead spaces in the brewery too that we can help you unlock. One of them, um, I'm just sort of drawing on some tanks here and I'm not drawing them in the right spot, but Fermenters, whilst they might look as round as, as uh, from the top, obviously there's a cone there and there is actually good access for um, your operator to work in. Um, he or she can get right in underneath those tanks and open valves. And so back in, backing the tanks, the fermenters, right, almost right up against each other, you still actually can, especially if they're big tanks, you can still actually walk straight through the gap. So it's, it's not necessarily a, a wall that's blocking um, access by having those tanks butting up against each other. And so exploring the ability to, to have that little space in and underneath to walk through, there's actually a, probably a prime example just here. So you can cut through there to get to the hoses on the other side quite comfortably and those tanks couldn't be closer together. So there are sort of little hidden gems, I guess, in how to, how to set everything up.
Yeah, and, and one thing, last comment, and I'm stop screen sharing at this point. Um, a lot of times, your glycol, if you don't put a top or the bottom, you know, you're just coming straight off the tank and those ports that you're going to thread into. Uh, a lot of times, they put them on the back of the tank, and I'm I'm, uh, I'm illustrating here. But what that does is that means these two tanks would then have to kick out. You'd have to have you know 300 or 400 between them. So another. I think pro tip, if you will, is putting those glycols in this dead space here, you know, utilizing when you're putting four tanks together like that, realizing that this is a space that you can't really use. And if you do it right um, in certain areas and you keep pathways possibly between the cones, that is dead space there that I see a lot of waste, especially because you won't, in this instance here, if you put them on the back, these would have to be, these couldn't be so close. So we put the glycols on these 45s, <clears throat> which utilizes that dead space. So. No, there's a lot of good points there about maximizing space. And it's like you said, the, the, the theme of today is just like you said, try not to have, try limit your dead space um, pockets mm. in, in your brewery. So, um, and there's some really cool tips there. Yeah. A bit, like you said, putting ports and, and certain things uh, in those, in those areas. So um well like i said i think we've bloody covered quite a lot of things and a lot of people to can take a lot out of today uh was there any sort of closing thoughts or or um points you guys wanted to drive home it's never a stupid question if, if you if you've got any you know if you've got anything you're putting a brew together you're speaking with a consultant or the manufacturer just ask as many many questions as you can you know you can't go back you can't come back to it later just always try and as much as possible cover everything you can that's what i'd say mm. so you know i when i when i work with with clients i say look if you've got any more questions is there anything else i, I can explain just try and get as, as much as, as much as upfront as possible absolutely i agree you've just got to talk it all through as you can see there's so many balls in the air and so many things to consider that connecting with with others and i guess that's the, the service that neil's able to offer to people and and bespoke offer as well is that we're actually going to go through those processes and and help because it, you can build one brewery i don't think anyone builds the first one right um so calling on as many people as you can other brewers in the area mm -hmm. walk into a brewer brewery that you know and you've got a relationship with someone and go what are the two things you'd change tomorrow if you could um because the brewer is always going to tell you the two things that change tomorrow um and so just learn from other people as much as you can and piece it together and be prepared to, to understand what you would have tweaked on your second brewery, you know? Because that's, that's actually a good point. Yeah, like, for example, the one we're talking about um, in Greece that we're working together with, um, obviously, they're going to put a bottling line as well, but you don't need to end up with, because they offer a CIP solution as well. So we're like, well, you don't need two CIP so solutions. So make sure if you're buying equipment from more than one place that everybody's speaking or get a, an overall equipment list and then make sure there isn't, anything you're buying two of and things like this as well. Mm. Um, because, you know, a lot of people offer turnkey solutions for their own individual piece of equipment, but it might mean that you don't need all those parts that are offered. So that, you know, you can save yourself a bit of money there as well. Mm. And making sure they're compatible as well, if you're getting- Exactly. Or... So like, yeah, if you wanna, if you've got, you know, how big's your compressor? Cause you might need the compressor for your centrifuge, but that's, and then obviously that's a big one as well. Um, having a dry air, some of you, you know, if you're if you're going to go into bottling and, and packaging, you definitely need um, dry and sterile air, but you, you don't necessarily need that for the brew house. But there's no point having to buy one later on. So, you know, even if it's more expensive at the start, you know, it might be worth buying that one compressor up front and then building into it later when when you need that dry and sterile air. Mm. So, you know, as a, again, as I say, so many moving parts you you're trying to think about is but yeah, you have to try and where do you want to be like Justin said at the end and then think about how you can front end those costs and save yourself money down the line. And just to finish off there, and, and Justin, you mentioned uh, no one can build the perfect brewery. Um, I'm up to um, over 40 plus episodes where I've sat down with people. Um, if I fuck mine up, I'm, I'm going to be look at it, looking a bit like a laughing stock of the industry, I think. <laughs> oh, mate, it'll be perfect for you. Yeah, It'll be perfect for you. It's what uh, I think it was Benedict who I had on from um, BSK Projects, so mm. we've become good mates. He said, mate, the amount of research and effort you've gone into knowing how to start a brewery, if you fuck it up, you're going to, yeah, it's, it's going to be pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> the world is watching, Chris. The world is watching. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah. Get, get, your, get your drainage right and the rest is forgivable. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Well, but yeah, uh, once again, guys, I really do appreciate you coming on. Uh, Justin, Neil, John, um, once again, really appreciate you um, sharing your time today. Well, thanks for asking us on and uh, yeah, it's been a, it's been fun. Thanks for having us, Chris. Look forward to uh, a beer in your brewery. Yeah, so do I, mate. <laughs> <laughs>